So continuing on in macroeconomics, we now look at private sector saving in the IS curve, IS standing for investment saving curve. Okay. To begin with, where does private sector saving come from? So private sector, households, businesses, where the, where's the actual saving come from? The equation that sort of equates this looks at, it's I for investment, okay? So we look at, it makes up from investment, as well as the fiscal deficit, which is government expenditure minus taxes. So the G for government expenditure, okay, minus taxes, So that's obviously a deficit. If the government are spending more than they're actually bringing in from taxes, that's a deficit. And then we've got, we've seen this before, exports minus imports, the trade balance. And we'll see a lot more of that in the final study session. So if we rearrange this equation, and I'll just do this right here on the side for you. It basically says that G minus T, if we bring that on this side, is equal to S minus I. We'll just put these in brackets, in fact. So we have the fiscal deficit, okay, is equal to savings minus investment minus the actual trade balance. So that implies that for a fiscal deficit to exist, the private sector must either save more than it invests, okay, in other words, S is more than I, okay? Or the fiscal, uh, they must run a trade deficit. And a trade deficit is where imports are higher than exports. Obviously, we're subtracting the trade deficit. So for a fiscal deficit to exist, okay, government expenditure higher than taxes, it needs to be the other way around with imports being higher than exports. So you subtract a sort of negative number and it becomes a positive, okay? So either one of those two there. And that's quite a key claim, that for the government to actually run a fiscal deficit, as we have in the UK, the US, either in the private sector, there has to be more saving than uh, investment, or imports need to be higher than exports. Okay? And that then brings us to the investment saving curve. In fact, we're going to look at investment saving as well as the, uh, as well as the, uh, money, the money curve, or the LM curve, it's also known as liquidity money supply curve. Okay, where this is all going to try and go, it's going to try and get us to an aggregate demand curve. Okay, and then from there we'll really build micro, uh, macroeconomics. So the investment saving curve looks at a relationship between income and interest rates, and it claims that there's an inverse relationship between them. Okay, really what it looks at is it looks at the relationship between interest rates and the way people invest, and hence it's called the investment curve, okay? So, if I just jump to this bottom bullet point here, it says, the higher the interest rate, the less people would invest, and that makes sense. If interest rates are high, I'm less likely going to go to a bank and invest more money. So, the higher the interest rate, the less people invest, and vice versa. Okay, so, we can see an inverse relationship there, okay? So, and then what the IS curve then does is it says at different levels of income, when we look at income, we look at national income, which we touched on earlier in this reading. So at different levels of national income, what's the effect on interest rates? And based on this effect that there's, uh, at higher rates, there's going to be less investment, we're actually going to find that there's an inverse relationship. So investment and savings are primary components that will adjust to maintain the equality between what people, uh, what aggregate expenditure and aggregate income is, okay? And that's why we have the IS curve. So, again, put simply, we have higher interest rates, less investment. There's an inverse relationship. At different national income levels, there remains this inverse relationship between national income and interest rates, okay? And that will then get us, if I could just sort of draw this, Okay. The IS curve, we're actually going to be looking at a relationship between interest rates here okay, and income here, and the IS curve actually shows an inverse relationship. Okay. So the higher rates are lower national income. Okay. Why is that? Because we said less investment. 
and investment is a component of national income. So that's the IS curve. The LM curve, on the other hand, is the liquidity preference money supply equilibrium. Okay? LM, LM for short, liquidity money supply. It shows the combination of interest rates and income. So same graph we had earlier. Okay? So that the money demanded equals money supply. In fact, we're going to get to the LM curve that's sort of highlighted here at the bottom of this page. Okay. We already saw the IS curve on a previous, uh, previously, now we look at the LM curve. Okay. But it's really looking at money supply and money demanded. So let's throw this on a page first. If we have interest rates on one axis and money on another axis, so we can look at money demanded, demand for money, very similar to how our microeconomics demand curve looks and the reason for that is when interest rates are high there is a lower demand for money and that again makes sense high interest rates we're less likely going to want to demand money from banks etc money supply in fact is argued to be a fixed level if i could draw that a bit more fixed again that's not great but it will do money supply is actually a fixed level because that's set by the central bank the amount of money supply in an economy is set by the central bank. Okay, so with that in mind, what do we have? We're going to ask ourselves, if there's higher national income, okay, if national income increases, if it does increase, there's actually a shift of the money demand curve. Okay. There's more money demanded at every single level of interest rates, so we actually, actually see an outward shift. It should be a parallel shift, but that does the job. It's an outward shift. So what are we seeing here? That at higher national income levels, with a, with a fixed level of money, so can we see that actually interest rates have gone up? So national income increases, and interest rate increases. So if we were to plot that on a graph, we can see there's a proportional relationship to that. So here the LM curve has a positive slope. Okay. So to put this another way, and this is how the CFA underlying readings put it this way, so if you didn't like the one with the graph, feel free to accept this version or vice versa. Okay. Higher levels of real income increase the demand for money, like I mentioned on that graph, there was a shift. And higher interest rates decrease the demand for money. Okay? So therefore, if real income increases, okay, an increase in real income must be offset by an increase in, real, uh, in, in interest rates or real interest rates, because the demand for money and the supply of money need to equate. Remember, the whole LM curve is looking at equating money demand and money supplied, looking at that equilibrium. So in other words, if real income goes up, interest rates need to go up to fall back into that balanced or that equilibrium position. Because remember, an increase in interest rates means there'll be less demand for money. Whereas an increase in real income means there'll be more demand for money, so we're back at the same point. Therefore, the LM curve has a positive slope. Real income goes up, interest rates also go up. Okay. Now, in fact, all this is trying to do is get us an equilibrium level here for the IS and LM curve, and it's plotting these components here at different price levels that gets us to the aggregate demand curve. In fact, you don't even really need this to get an aggregate demand curve, but the CFA feel that this is necessary to explain it, although many books will work without the IS and LM curve. Okay. So what we have here is that all of these equilibrium points, if we actually plotted these equilibrium points at different price levels, we'd actually get an aggregate demand curve, and it's downward sloping. Recall that aggregate demand makes up consumption, investment, government expenditure, and exports minus imports. Okay. So all things equal, the higher the price level, the smaller or the lower 
the actual real GDP demand. And that's what we're plotting. Price level, which is really a nice little measure for inflation, and real GDP, which is really a measure for output of the country, but in real terms, stripped out of inflation. Okay. Okay. And then it's worth taking up these points here, which just highlight why, when the aggregate demand curve will be flatter. Okay. It will be flatter when investment expenditure is highly sensitive to interest rates. Okay. So in other words, the income will have to adjust by more okay, to allow for saving in investment. So linking back, so investment expenditure has to be highly sensitive, is highly sensitive to interest rate makes it flatter. Okay? In other words, the income will have to move by a greater amount. So remember, a flatter aggregate demand, if it helps, I can draw one here. Can you see that for any change in price level, okay, there's a greater change in income or output. Yeah, remember we equated aggregate expenditure and aggregate income. So there's a greater move in income. The investment expenditure has to be highly sensitive. Income will need to increase by a greater amount to allow that savings. Okay. Saving is insensitive to income. Okay. As well, similar story. Income will have to adjust by a greater amount. Okay. And then we've got the bottom two, which looks at money demanded being insensitive to interest rates and income, okay? And that looks at it more from the LM point of view, the liquidity money, uh, uh, the liquidity money supply point of view. We see insensitive demand here, okay? And that requires, so we see a larger change in interest rates have to, is required to equate money demanded and money supplied, okay? Okay. Now we look at what's going to cause the aggregate demand curve to actually shift out. Okay. Sorry, so put price level here. Got price level and we have real GDP. And we've already mentioned the aggregate demand curve is that sort of downward slope. So what causes it to shift? We've seen in microeconomics what causes a demand curve to shift. But what causes an aggregate demand curve to shift? In fact, it's really the components. Remember, an aggregate demand curve, we're looking at consumption, investment, government expenditure, and exports minus imports. Okay. So if there's an increase in household wealth, there's an increase in current assumption. C goes up, aggregate demand curve shifts out. Expectations. If there's an increase in expected future income, it increases what we spend now. Think about yourself. If you expect a higher salary next year, you might actually spend more today because you expect that money to be coming rolling in next year. So again, consumption increases. Increase in expected future inflation. Prices are going to be higher next year. Spend more today. Again, higher consumption sees a component of aggregate demand. Increase in expected future businesses. Uh, sorry, future profits for businesses, they might invest more in the business, higher investment, okay? What about fiscal and monetary policy? Well, fiscal policy looks at government expenditure and taxes. Well, government expenditure is a component of aggregate demand, so higher government expenditure, the aggregate demand curve shifts out, okay? Money supply, uh, so monetary policy looks at money supply and changes in interest rates. So if there's a decrease in interest rates, interest rates go down, okay, then people might invest more, investment goes up, and consumption might increase. People might borrow money to spend, credit card borrowing, whatever it might be, okay? What about world economy? If there's an increase in foreign income, they might buy more of our exports, they might import more goods, so we sell more exports. Exports goes up, we'll use the term X here for exports. X minus M will increase, and therefore aggregate demand. Any component comes out, it shifts out. Appreciating, encourage, uh, cur appreciating currencies actually encourage import, uh, imports because they become less expensive. Let's have a think why. If our currency, if let's say the UK pound appreciates, it's stronger, 
we can buy more foreign goods. It's cheaper to buy foreign goods. But everyone else finds our currency more expensive. So when they're buying our goods, in other words, the UK's exports or another country's imports, they actually find it's more expensive. So what happens is, if your currency strengthens, then exports minus imports actually goes down. Discourages exports, increases imports, and that is an aggregate demand shift downwards. And it's worth picking up all of these relationships. A good number of questions in your exam focusing on this. So have a go at this question here. You might want to pause the screen and have a go, but we'll talk through it. A decrease in money supply, you'll be looking at, it would cause the aggregate demand curve to shift to the left. And also the money uh, LM curve we'll look at in a moment. Okay, so once again on your axis, you have price level and real GDP. So your aggregate demand has shifted. Why is that? Well, there's less money supply, so the banks have less money. The banks are willing to less, uh, lend less money, so that people can't borrow money and invest, people can't borrow money and spend. So consumption and investment have gone down. Consumption and investment have gone down. Aggregate demand shifts to the left. What about the LM curve? The LM curve is an interesting one. Remember what the LM curve did. The LM curve represented combinations of income and interest rates where money supply is equal to money demand. Okay, let's get rid of this. So now let's have a look. Why does the LM curve shift to the left, you might be asking. Okay, so the question said money supply decreases. If money supply decreases, okay, money demanded must decrease to remain in equilibrium, okay? How can money demand decrease? Well, it can decrease with interest rates going up. Or another way for money demand to decrease is income going down. Therefore, at every level of interest, if we keep interest rates constant, then income must decrease. If income decreases, that there is a leftward shift of the LM curve. And that's the idea, the LM curve must also shift to the left.